Hi everybody, it's Joey Remini here from seekingbalance.com.au and I am really pleased today to welcome to the call Kate Bain, who's a PhD in occupational therapy and Kate specialises in recovery for children, so paediatrics with cerebral palsy. So welcome Kate. Hi Joey, lovely to be on your podcast. I know. So Thanks for inviting me. I'm sorry I'm in my running gear. I've just been for a run. I actually, didn't realise it was a video. <laughs> well, actually we're both in our I'm in my leggings as well. So Perfect. Exactly. So it's all about connecting as humans and Kate and I know each other actually through music. And we're gonna link that a little bit into this call, whether Kate knows it or not. But we actually have quite a lot in common, Kate and I, and I'm super blessed to have you on the call. I love the way you work with children who have cerebral palsy and I could, and I've tried to pick your brain on that for hours on end in, in car trips. And it really fascinates me the approach you take. And I'm sure everybody listening would have heard it some, in some way or another, whether, whether subconsciously or overtly, that when people are born with cerebral palsy, it can feel quite helpless and quite hopeless. So, you know, the, oxygen has perhaps not been able to feed the brain sufficiently and so there's parts of the nervous system or the brain or the spinal column that are are not formed perhaps enough and then children may have some very obvious dysfunctions and do you want to just speak a little bit about the science of you know what's obviously everyone's born differently they're not going to be coming out like exactly the same so cerebral palsy is an umbrella term But do you want to talk with about what you do and how you offer hope for rehabilitation and recovery and and shifting for these families? Yeah, thanks, Joey. Uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to to talk. It's certainly uh, a very favourite topic of mine and a life journey, really. Mm -hmm. I... uh, Perhaps I'll start start way back when I first uh, was attracted to becoming a therapist. I love children. I always loved children yeah. and babies. and never imagined that it would be able to be my daily work, but it, but it is. Babies, children, uh, young adults, teenagers. Families and children who want to be able to do better at certain daily tasks, any daily task, Mm -hmm. that's the sort of thing they come to therapists like me for. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and cerebral palsy and neuromotor-based disorders, so neuromotor, the the brain side of the, uh, the motor system, the motor control system that drives our muscles to do daily tasks, they're the brain pathways that get interrupted by brain insult. And that happens in a number of ways yeah. uh, d- during fetal development, around the birth process, mm-hmm. uh, a young child who may have a, a stroke. All of those come under the category of uh, cerebral palsy. So, and, uh, Go ahead, Joe. So, so someone could have the label cerebral palsy and you could have a thousand children and they all have completely different manifestations of how that looks that's that's a very very important statement every single every one of us is a human being but every baby every child every young person who comes to see me and my colleagues is a unique individual Mm -hmm. and i'm going to just you'll find i interrupt myself joey and i go (laughs) off the little byways but uh i'll do my best to come back Every child, as I said, every person is an individual. You and I believe that. And that's where we always start. So I always find out about, from families, tell me about your child. Tell me about your baby. What do they love? What are, they, what are the things they're really good at? And that's a long conversation. Mm. And yes, I've got medical information that I've collected before from them. We get into that. We get into the details. We get to work. But... The uniqueness of of each individual is so important. And so coming back to the cerebral palsies, uh, all of the different brain insults, we could call them, they're all very different. There's different classifications of cerebral palsy. So some children are very stiff. Some children are 
not at all stiff enough in their muscles. Uh, other children have intermittent uh, fluctuations of muscle tones and they're not steady. And I think there's a there's intersections in the work you and I do. Mm -hmm. Certain children have uh, cerebellar damage, which I guess is pretty close to the work that mm -hmm. you're doing. The mid, down in the back brain and the midbrain. That, that cerebellar process at the, at the back of the brain yeah. really helps us to, to uh, refine and to sequence and time our movements. And by the way, Joey, yeah. uh, interrupting myself again, I read something very interesting the other day that musicians, which is how we met as film yeah. players, that's a daily task that you and I have chosen to spend a lot of time on. Mm -hmm. possibly neuroplasticities happen in our brain because guess what our cerebellums as fiddle players are bigger than other people's cerebellums so this is, uh, this is an example yeah of neuroplasticity at work yes yeah, so, so i want to just feed in a little bit here so kate and i are both highly trained in understanding how the brain receives information from the body and how the brain organizes itself and then also filters and processes information that it can then deliver to the body. So it's a two-way system where the, the legs and feet and arms and your trunk are collecting information and sending it up into your brain. So it's feeding information in that the brain's using. And then the brain's categorizing that and it's telling the arms and legs, et cetera, what to do with that information. And the way the brain is organized, for those of you who, who aren't, haven't really um, read much about the brain is we have like a left and a right side of the brain and we have the back part which we call the cerebellum which does a lot of our animal functions and a lot of our coordination skills digestion sleep sexuality hunger a lot of really basic animal functions are happening in our back brain and in the midbrain we have a lot of relay centers and places where the brain's collecting huge amounts of data and figuring out what's most relevant now, what do I need now, and which bits am I going to ignore, and which bits am I going to absolutely prioritize and put them to the top. So we've got these organizational centers in the middle. And the motor strip that Kate was talking about, um, it's, it, it runs along the side of the brain, or so it's sort of the center, but it's like a long strip. You could almost cut it like a piece of cake. And it's sending all different information. We'll have an, an area of the brain for our big toe and an area of the brain for our shoulder and area of the brain for skin and touch. So that's sensory information and areas of the brain for movement information, even moving our lips, moving our tongue, everything. It's all discreetly mapped. And for some children who have some cerebral palsy condition, wherever that may have started in their development or their birthing, some of those brain pathways haven't been haven't is it that they haven't had enough oxygen to develop or, or they don't even know all of the mechanisms in in how the brain has been impacted do, do you can you speak on that a little bit kate i can speak about it a little bit but i'm i'm not an expert here there's a, there's quite a number of reasons how mm. little baby brains mm. get that most brain, baby brains do very well indeed, and they're absolutely fine. But deprivation of oxygen's a, a big thing. So, uh, but luckily, our brains have got so much unused matter. I know. There's plenty of uh, there's plenty of brain that can be taken up and can learn to do new things. Mm -hmm. And so, in our field, looking at the difficulties with performing daily tasks that are requested of us as therapists, mm -hmm. uh, postura, the postura and the postural and movement components of any task. So mm -hmm. we go back to the to the fiddle, being able to uh, stand up straight, to use our core muscles to keep ourselves up against gravity, the postural muscles, and Again, if we look at the, the daily task of playing the fiddle, the movement muscles, the long skinny muscles of the skeleton that move the different parts of our upper extremities, our, our arms and, and hands and fingers. Uh, so we're looking very closely at you know, what's not working so well for this task. And so as therapists, we have to get to work 
on those particular muscles and mm -hmm. what their jobs are for the given daily task that we're working on. Yeah. Uh, but, but foundational to that is the fact that, yes, a certain amount of brain matter was adversely affected by, let's say, a lack of oxygen, uh, but now what are we going to do about it? And we, we know now, we've known for a couple of decades at yeah. least, the promise of neuroplasticity. And yeah. so, and we've learned a great deal about the three foundations for our work, motor development, mm -hmm. the, the step by tiny step by tiny step of the way uh, babies and young children develop in all aspects, mm -hmm. mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, yeah. all of what you said, the holistic development, the way we learn, motor learning, the way we embed new skills, that's mm -hmm. a very much a shared uh, field for both of us, Joe, emotional learning, how we learn to do tasks, how we learn to, to balance and how we learn to, to play the fiddle. <laughs> and, uh, motor development, uh, motor learning and motor control. So mo the motor control parts perhaps... Uh, well, let me just say that the motor control part is very much dependent on the, the postural and movement muscles, the coordination of those within any daily task. So it's a fun sort of job to have because you could be working on, on anything and it's all based in our work. It's based on play, mm -hmm. engagement. It uh, has to be meaningful to the child and the family. It's what they've come and asked for. Yeah, so I want to kind of summarise some of that. So what we're saying is there are actual physical damaged areas and in the cerebral palsy case, it's in the motor part of the brain and in clients who I see with vertigo or tinnitus, they're actually having sensory information, which is in a different slice of the brain. So you're getting a little different cake slice of the brain and the sensory touch receptive information in my clients is not feeling normal. So they'll have muscles and things that are working, they can use their arms, they can use their fingers, but they're not feeling that, the, that it's centered or it's steady, or they might feel that they're moving or there's roaring sounds or swooshing sounds. And some people will say they feel like they're an astronaut, so they don't really feel grounded on the on the earth and so it's quite a discombobulating and disconcerting feeling so the work kate and i are doing is actually incredibly similar but we're working on different aspects of the process because part of the brain is giving information and i've got a great neuroplasticity example from my fiddle so you know if you're holding your fiddle like this and you can have the bow playing right up here near your face or you can extend your arm down and and be playing a longer bow and I noticed I very rarely play up here near what we call the nut or the frog. And so I really hadn't developed any motor neurons or any familiarity with those neural pathways of, of holding my bow really close up here near my face. And so then, of course, I self-diagnosed myself as needing a bit of practice there. And I started to experiment with playing my fiddle in this unfamiliar and unusual way, which felt really weird, didn't sound great, and I had very little practice at it. And I was really amazed, Kate, at how quickly my brain latched onto that new skill and enabled me to then, say, take a part of my brain that wasn't busy. So it was, it was open real estate. And it started creating new neural patterns for getting my arm position and my wrist and my fingers working up much closer to my face instead of doing a long bow and playing further away from my face. And... So it's this idea of saying, even if you have permanent damage to your brain or to your sensory system, you don't need to actually cure that or get rid of that damage. That damage can sit there until the day you die. Like it's not doing you any harm. What we need to do is start, rather than focusing on what we don't have, it's the lost function, is give ourselves way to say, okay, what's meaningful to me? Do I want to learn how to do, put my shoes on? Do I want to learn how to stand, stand steady in a crowd? Do I want to learn how to walk down the street on my own? Do I want to learn how to stand in windy days? Because windy days are really hard for me, but I love the wind and I want to feel safe in the wind. So we find a task that's meaningful to us for whatever reason, never silly. Kate and I know that every human has 
different flavors, right? So different people have different goals. And then we try and find ways to very cleverly rearrange the brain, make use of your real estate in your brain that's sitting there not being used and actually create new neural pathways that enable you to put on your shoes or walk down the street on your own or stand in the wind and feel stable. So it's this idea of acknowledging the injury or as Kate called it, the insult, acknowledging it's there, but rather than focusing on what we don't have, we really shift the rehabilitation, the recovery, the healing into what do we want to build, right? So it's, it's all about adding additional pathways. And I don't know about your line of work, Kate, because this piece is different, but with the vertigo and tinnitus clients, they're often focused on getting rid of symptoms, right? So it's all about deleting. They want to get rid of what they don't like. And by the time they come and see me, I say, look, it's not a splinter in your foot. We can't pull it out. We can't remove it. We can't delete what you're feeling. But what we can do is rearrange the brain so the brain filters say, I don't really want to feel that. It's not relevant. It's not helpful. It's not useful. So we need to shift the brain into creating new neural pathways that refire in different areas of the brain and focus on sensations that might feel calm or steady or peaceful or centered. And people learn how to build those pathways. And then as those pathways get stronger and bigger and used more often, the symptom pathways by default weaken. And so there is a very physical change happening in people's brains and as Kate said apparently fiddle players have a larger cerebellum which means by the nature of the complexity of playing the fiddle our brain is growing in a certain area that's required to coordinate all of that very fast and subtle musical detail so people think it's all in your head or it's all psychological and actually no it's it's very physical so do you want to speak a little bit to that Kate Yes. Uh, I don't think where I should start. Perhaps I should start with uh, sensory registration. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've got, how many senses have we got, Joey? Five. We've got yep. the sense of uh, motion and steadiness through the vestibular system. We've got the system of touch. We've got our eyes for seeing, our ears for hearing. What am I telling an audiologist that for? A nose for smelling. Uh, and taste. And we've got a sense of taste and we've got a sense of proprioception, which is proprioception's uh, not one that we're really easily familiar with, but it's the little senses that are in all our muscles, all our joints, in our skin, which are telling us the whole time exactly mm. where every part of our body is, mm. whether it's still, and if it's moving, how it's moving and how far it's moving. Mm. And in fact, every single action, so in these daily tasks, which is my bread and butter, what people see me about, uh, the, we know that sensation uh, initiates mm -hmm. every single movement. It takes a bit of thinking about that, but you know, why do I walk across the room? Because I can see my fiddle over the other side of my study, and I want to get it. So it's a maybe I I uh, I've got Joey playing a fiddle near me, so I want to walk to Joey. I pick up my fiddle. So motivation and sensory inputs. I hear a sound outside, I go outside, I see something, I move towards it, I pick it up, I taste it. Everything's initiated by sensation. And the way we process sensation, you've in introduced the sensory strip here. Mm. I'm also going to make the conversation a bit more complicated by diving down further into the brain. And this is really a message of hope Mm. How we use, how we can use sensory processing to initiate neuroplasticity. How we can use sensory processing to uh, self-regulate, to manage our emotions, to manage our feelings of being out of control, to manage our feelings of unsteadiness, very survival. Yeah. Uh, 
the challenge of gravity trying to pull us over, how our sensations, we combine information from our senses and we use that information to help us perform daily tasks. And I, I might just stop there, but I wanted to talk very briefly about the neuroplasticity brain machinery mm -hmm. in a sim simple way because it, it sh it's a hopeful message because it shows us how we can do this for ourselves to change our feelings and sensory responses. Yeah. So, I mean, when we say it's survival, it's really like if you think about cavemen and cave women, the number one thing we need to know is that, you know, we're not being chased by a violent tribal person who's from the other tribe over there. And there's not a, an animal or a wild beast chasing us. And we're not being poisoned by berries and nuts and, and things that we've just eaten because back in those days, of course, there was no refrigeration. So the body's looking for genuine safety. We're checking, is there a flood? Is there an earthquake? Is there a tsunami? Is there lightning? And we're making sure that we've got all of our needs met. So there's this idea of genuine safety. And we're gathering all of that information by feeling. And that's actually a huge part of the recovery process that my Rocksteady clients go through is actually feeling, am I safe right now? And what evidence do I have to suggest that right now I'm not on fire? I'm not in a flood. There's no wild beast. And you actually go through it all. Is there anything I need to address right now? Because if you are in danger, it's not a time for neuroplasticity. You have to remove yourself from the dangerous situation. So unless you're safe, your brain is actually not ready to learn. Okay, so it's not really ready to get that vac vacant real estate and start building new neural pathways and learning a new function or a new steadiness. And that's why in this modern day age, the concept of chronic stress is actually a really big concern for anyone trying to recover from any form of chronic, um, chronic condition. Because if we're not able to sleep at night and we're laying in bed really worried about going to work the next day, or we're worried about our next vertigo attack, or we're worried that the tinnitus won't disappear, we're actually keeping that animal brain it's right literally between the ears in the center of our head. We have the emotional centers. And if that's in stress mode, fight, flight, or freeze mode, then the brain itself is not in like a playful and open situation where the left and right sides of the brain can freely exchange information, the corpus callosum can open up. That's the super highway that connects left and right. And that's this idea of play and joy and openness only happens if we're safe. And that's what the science is showing we need for neuroplasticity. So a huge part of recovery is understanding what is chronic stress. How do I know if I'm personally in fight, flight, or freeze? And how can I offer myself strategies, techniques, and exercises to help actually reduce my anxiety, my worry, interrupt the stress cycles, and go back into what we call the parasympathetic mode, which is that natural way of soothing the body, maintaining and repairing our biology on the inside. So this is happening not only in the brain, but throughout the whole of our body head to toe. So that's the kind of safety business we're talking about in survival mode. And even though we're not cave women anymore and cave men, we still have modern day threats. And in this day and age, it's often I'm not pretty enough, I'm not earning enough money, you know, I, what do you, it's, we're worried about arriving to work safely, I can't drive, what if I'm not a good mother, I can't bend down and pick up my child. So all of these things are creating exactly the same stress response biologically as would happen if a wild lion was chasing us. So the brain doesn't know the difference. And this is where we have to come in and start to, as Kate suggested, learn to manage and filter our feelings to make sure it's working in real time in 2018 and we're able to self-soothe so we can step into play and joy more often. So do you want to add any more to that, Kate? Yeah, I think that's really, really comprehensive tour around the brain you've given us, Joey. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to have to do it in a simpler form. I'm going to take it from, Good. I'm going to talk about the front brain, mm -hmm. particularly the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, this, is, this is what human beings have, 
I've got uh, your thinking brain that can direct everything else. So I'm going to come back to the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And then now I'm going to zip down into the brainstem mm -hmm. and talk about, I like your, the word filtering. There's a, there's a system in there called the reticular uh, yes. activating system. Yeah. And it's sort of, there's a stop-go process. And I think about our watering systems here on the farm where the water can get through and go up to the brain or it's stopped. And that system is wired. It's, it's what's, what's the word? It's primary role. It's wired for survival. Mm -hmm. It's very important that if that tiger's coming, you're seeing that tiger, you're hearing the roar, all that sensory information I talked about before, you're going to run out of there. Yes, so that's the reticular activating system, but it's also got the stop valves as well. And then deep in the brain, as you said, Joey, uh, deep in the brain, what's it called? The hypothalamus and the hippocampus, the amygdala. Yep. I don't know, the amygdala, the amygdala is getting a little bit of a write-up in the daily press nowadays because it's, it's, uh, it's a real centre for alarm. Yeah. Well, something terrible's happening. Uh, maybe it's you're going to fall over, or this overpowering sound is just going to. I cannot manage it. So the amygdala is really prioritised too. And in in our therapy, we talk about for children who are very frightened, who mm -hmm. have a, multiple difficulties. We talk about soothing the amygdala. The neuroscientists talk about soothing the amygdala. Uh, and Joey mentioned in, in, that, uh, in that limbic system, it's called, we've had mm -hmm. the prefrontal cortex, the reticular system, and then the deep limbic system of emotion and memory. Uh, part of that, I don't want to get too much into detail, but part of that system regulates our autonomic, autonomic nervous system, our breathing, our respiration. It allows us to calm down. Mm -hmm. It's part of mindfulness, meditation, yoga practices, breathing, or the other, the other part. Am I on video or just audio? Because I'm doing... You're on video, yeah. Okay, I'm doing brain pictures here. So there's the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic. This one revs you up. I'm in danger. It's got all the physiological mechanisms so we want to get to the parasympathetic nervous system, regulation, self-regulation. And repair. Pardon? And repair. Self-regulation, repair definitely, but the way we regulate ourselves, Joey, I know you know, know what I mean. So getting through uh, this deep part of the brain, getting through our thinking frontal mm -hmm. cortex and through the reticular formation. So... Uh, how do we do that? So how does a very brief talk about how neuroplasticity actually happens? How am I going? Is this okay? Beautiful. Keep going. Okay. Uh, because who cares about brain structures? It's what you and I and others, what we're all doing to change our habits and change the scary things that are happening to us all the time. So we've just had a really interesting little experience where we've had a massive thunderstorm where Kate and I live and Kate's just, you know, five or so kilometres down the road from me and she lost electricity and lost internet. So we've got uh, Dr. Kate Bain back on via her phone. So we've lost the video temporarily. But I wanted to summarise, we were just talking, like we've got all these different specialised areas of the brain. We've got the emotional centres with fancy words like amygdala, hippocampus, hypothalamus, the reticular activating system down in the, the base of the brain, I suppose we could call it. And that's filtering what's important and it's really looking for problems, right? It's looking for danger. It's searching for things that are going to threaten our livelihood. And that's really our alarm system. And then we've got the frontal cortex at the front of our brain, which holds part of our personality. It holds our relationship to the world around us. It makes us very human. It enables us to plan a holiday and think into the future and manage an Excel spreadsheet on a computer. So the front of our brain really empowers us to make choices. And the front of our brain can communicate 
uh, and help moderate some of these very animal systems happening in our midbrain and through our filters so we can say, you know what, that thunderclap and lightning was really scary and my heart's pounding and I'm anxious, but I'm safe. So the front brain can help actually regulate some of those automated emotional reactions and help us to smooth the landing so we can come back to our center and come back to our steadiness. So Kate, one thing you were talking about was how is this practically useful to us? Like what can we do? And, and you, you briefly started to mention me, to me, but not on the call about intensity, uh, frequency and duration of these neural synapses yeah. connecting. Do you want to just t touch base on how this is practical, what we can do practically? Yeah, so it's all, you know, neuroplasticity is all about habits. Mm -hmm. It's teaching our brains habit, our brain habits, and there's plenty of spare space yep. to take up in the brain to create new neural pathways. Mm -hmm. And so... And I talked about uh, how we use sensory processing mm -hmm. to, to help to assist in this process of creating new pathways. And so we, I'm going to focus, I talked about three areas of the brain. I want to come back to the good guys who are really going to help us, the prefrontal cortex yeah which absolutely. can really monitor and direct all right i want some new brain put over to to the task of helping me feel safe in space and i'm yeah. going to use that uh what joey called the uh sympath the parasympathetic nervous system which will help my body's physiology it'll help my heart rate calm down It'll help my breathing calm down, increase the volume of oxygen to my brain. So from what I said before, we're going to take the good guys, the, the, frontal, the prefrontal cortex and the um, way down in the parasympathetic nervous system deep within the brain. And how do we actually utilise that information to create new pathways? The, I'm going to say three three words now. One of them is intensity, which is how much, how much we do of something. One is duration, how long we do it for. Mm -hmm. And the third one is, uh, uh, what is the third one? Frequency. Uh, amount. Frequency, thanks, Joey. How, how often we do it. So the amount, how often and for what period of time. So let's, could I... Could I venture into an area that's only part my own, Joey, mindfulness? Because I know it's, that's a common meeting ground for you and I. Mm -hmm. uh, I use mindfulness with children who are old enough who are envisaging, envisaging, however you say that word, themselves, being able to do uh, a task that's been complex for them. So, for yeah. example, it might, might be something like uh, being able to use their iPhone to talk with their friends for a teenager. Yep. Uh, how, do I, how do I get my hands that don't work too well? So part of it it is visualisation, mindfulness, mm -hmm. and creating uh, the can-do pathways in the brain. So let's go back to frequency, duration, and intensity. How often you practice, how often I have a young person practicing using their iPhone, how often, Joey, uh, you're working with a client to help them uh, in a mindfulness exercise about their security in terms of uh, their balance, for example, on Mother Earth, mm -hmm. uh, how often something's practiced for how long and over what um, intensity, you know, how, how, how much you get into it. Yeah, and I want to. So I want to yeah. also just piece that into. Yeah. So what what we're kind of saying is, if we have this vision, okay, I want to be able to use my iPhone. It actually starts with an idea. So it's, we're we're starting by implanting the neural idea in our brain, where we're saying, okay, well, I'm going to need space somewhere in my brain to create pathways that are going to enable me to hold the iPhone, you know, touch, feel see it there's going to be a whole relationship we're developing with the iphone and that skill set is going to need real estate so first of all the idea comes in and we have to sort of tell the brain to prepare space for that 
And then the intensity, frequency, and duration is like, well, we're going to have neurons going from A to B. And they're going to be bouncing to and from each other. And their whole networks, they're quite complex. And the more we can get those neurons going ding, 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 and they're synaptically communicating, that's the frequency. And the intensity is how many of the neurons are firing. So do you have one neuron or two neurons or 20,000 neurons? So from the inner ears, in each inner ear, we have 30,000 fibers running from the inner ear to the brain. So it's like how many of those neural fibers are actually firing? Low intensity would be just a few. High intensity would be a, a bundle of thousands. And then duration is how long are they actually communicating for? So is it just one or two little bing, 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 and then it's over? Or is it a full five minutes? Now, part of this is dictated by our own focus and our own attention to detail and our own awareness. And mindfulness comes in because it helps us concentrate and stay on the task. And visualization can be one of those ways we do that. So just wanted to kind of piece in the science and the, the practicality of visualizing using a mobile phone. So it's actually affecting the brain, that process. So do you want to um, kind of keep building that up, Kate? Yeah, I will. And... Uh... Uh, one thing that uh, you said reminded me to say, Joey, mm. uh, about motivation and the the will to do something. And there's a, a part in the brain um, in that prefrontal cortex area brain, the planning part of the brain is called the driven to do something. If you're driven to work on a balance exercise or, or whatever it is to be able to use your fingers on your iPhone, mm -hmm. uh, that motivational, that very conscious motivational part drives, as Joey said, and I'm going to word, use Joey's words for uh, neuroplasticity, ding, 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 what's <laughs> happening? And, and I'm going to dive deeper now, if I could, Joey, Mm -hmm. And take this intensity, frequency, duration, uh, which are uh, neuroscience facts. Uh, these, these are neuroscientific words for how much we practice, uh, how, how many um, uh, fibres that you're getting to uh, do your work for you. And now I'm going to take it down to the to the neurochemistry, uh, Ooh, yeah. right down to the level of the chemical transmission from one nerve fibre to the other. Yep. Now, I just want to blow your socks off for a moment. Are you ready? I'm ready. We are born <laughs> with, wait for it, 100 billion neurons. And uh, a two to three-year-old, do you know how many connections each of those nerve nerve pathways neurons nerve cells whatever we want to call them each has 15,000 connections or synapses it's so a just, synapse it's mind-boggling it's as Terry said a synapse is the connection between one tiny tiny little microscopic nerve cell to another nerve cell yeah but we're going we're going to dive right down into that level now because so I want to assure you that what you're doing is based on solid neuroscience and from one side of the gap or the synapse between yeah. the two tiny little nerve fibres or nerve yeah. cells is a gap that it's like having to cross a mighty river. You've got to get yeah. the nerve signal. And I'm going to use, action. I'm going to go use my hands to demonstrate. So I've got one nerve here with little nerve endings. And yeah, just neuron. just put two index fingers together, would you? We'll keep it, so we'll simple, keep it simple. That's it. So we've got a gap. There's a gap. And so, at the end of Joey's right index finger, there's chemicals called neurotransmitters, and they have to be able to get secreted out of little kind of storage vessels to yeah. get across the gap to the other side to her left. So they they move like finger. this over, and then they meet this finger. It's got to close the gap to allow the electrical current or the, it's called an action potential, a nerve action potential to fire, to carry mm -hmm. that message, I am safe. Goes that to way. To build up. Yeah. yeah. And so if you multiply that by, what did we say, 15,000 yeah. times, and the more sensory pathways you've got on the case, 
seeing more team it, members, feeling it, more team members. Yeah. That uh, that uh, summates summations the, the name for if you can get enough information with the same message through different sensory sensations, modalities, the yeah. more likely, the more likely uh, that signal will cross that gap. And so that's where intensity, duration, and frequency comes in again. Yeah. Uh, the more of the transmitter, neurotransmitter that can be released, the over the longer period of time, uh, and the uh, intensity, and this is, uh, and the frequency I left out. Sort of how often that continues to flow that signal across that gap. Yeah, and we're yeah. we're going to come out now from making it a very simple Joey's two fingers to this being thousands and thousands of synapses firing. The more they fire, the more yeah. The, the brain, the neural me mechanisms, the biomechanics, as well as the chemistry, uh, become moved from being soft wiring to hard wiring, and we call them neural maps. They're actual maps. For well, this is this is what happens when I sit down to meditate or I'm doing yoga, and the speed of transmission. Uh, increases and the proliferation of nerve fibers around that function mm -hmm. strengthen. So, so that's uh, I'll come out of that now. And, and and Joey, if you could make a comment now, I'd really appreciate that. Well, some people will have heard me say neurons that fire together wire together, and this is yeah. what we're talking about. When you have one common message, and for most of us, when we're feeling um, upset and we don't like what we're feeling in our body, the most natural and normal response is to say, I'm anxious, I don't feel safe, I don't like this. And we will have thousands of neurons spreading that message. It's like everyone's on a text message and there's hundreds of text or thousands of text messages being sent around our brain and our body via these little neurotransmitter chemical messages saying, I'm not safe. And so what we're now doing is saying, well, actually, I am safe and I can feel my bum on the seat. And so there's some neural messages saying I'm safe, little text messages through the brain. And then we've got our ears saying, well, actually, I can hear right now the environment. I mean, I'm hearing, you know, people moving around me. I'm hearing that it's calm. You know, the thunderstorms quieten. There's no flood. There's no fire. So we can hear messages of safety and we can feel it in our shoulders and we can feel it in our elbows and we can actually get a lot of these sensory messages starting to feel safe and send little messages to more and more neurons. And what we, what we want to do is have more messages of safety and less messages of anxiety. And so building that ratio of safety, kind of overpowering the danger messages is a huge part of rehabilitation. And there's a very um, evidence-based neuroscience backing to it. And I don't know about you, Kate, but a really large part of the soothing system is touch. So actually feeling safe in terms of like cuddling an upset baby and soothing it through that very animal touch is a really powerful way to use proprioception to help actually overcome some of those fear signals. You must use that a lot with children, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely. And mm. I don't know if you can remember back to the... Uh, when I talked about soothing the amygdala, yep, yep. way down deep in the limbic system, it's that system which is, oh, oh now I'm in trouble, that system. Mm -hmm. uh, the the propri the proprioceptive, pardon? Yes, in the middle the of the brain. The proprioception doesn't go in the middle of the brain. Proprioceptive processing doesn't go by the amygdala. It goes straight to the thalamus, to the cortical processing area, or mm. I should say the the outer side, the outer parts of the brain that process sensory information and deep mm -hmm. touch pressure uh, are sensations that are interpreted as yeah. calming. Yes. And I've been thinking about yoga, for example, and sustained postures, whether that's uh, part of the calming well, it's process, Joey. I don't know. It's not, not necessarily that straightforward. So people could be doing generic mindfulness classes or generic yoga classes and not getting anywhere. 
So it's really about the relationship you have to the touch you're feeling. So I usually get clients to experiment with feeling what feels comforting and what feels nurturing. And that can look like anything at all. So it's very personal. For me, I love to have one hand on my, on my chest and one hand on my belly or my ribs and just to really hold my emotional centers and connect back into my breathing. And that touch of my own hands on my body, it sends off a lot of very fast and powerful neural signals that tell me I'm centered and I'm safe. And my brain, because I've practiced it so much, can very readily receive that. So if I get a fright, I can hold my center and I can start to give the brain the signals that I know it needs, which is I'm safe, I'm centered, I'm here, and I'm supported. So yeah. it's not necessarily as simple as like putting a yoga DVD on or something like that. because yeah. It is a much more personal and customized process, which would be the same for your, your right. child. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's the way a... A, a therapeutic intervention is practiced or, or taught and practiced the specifics of the way that is practiced uh, based on these uh, facts that have come through uh, uh, research in the neurosciences that mm -hmm. uh, help us, Joey, you and I, in the way we practice. And for me, for example, with very fractious babies who've had stormy births and mm. are very hypersensitive. Their, their filter systems uh, yeah. set at a very uh, low threshold. They take in scary information much more easily than other more typically developing babies. So just an example in my field. But I wondered if I could go on to uh, a few sort of hints and tips for promoting neuroplasticity and this would, comes from I would an enormous love, amount of research i would absolutely love that and do you reckon we could summarize it in two minutes or is that yes certainly so this comes from uh, neuroplasticity therapeutics research i'm going to give you a few buzzwords that will really help <laughs> to uh, make neuroplasticity work for you mm -hmm. it has to be motivating for you individually to you it has to be fun if you can enjoy it and set yourself a goal and remember to reward yourself that's mm -hmm. going to affect all the way down to that wiring yep. it's never too late for brain change yep use lots of senses i'm reading out my cheat sheet here surprise the brain mm -hmm. have some variability in your practice Definitely. Ramp it up because our brains can habituate. Oh, I can do that. That's too easy. And so the connections stop happening. And I'm just going to, to end on uh, helping yourself to recognize your success, to experience success over and over. And that will get the neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine. Uh, yeah. Or dopamine flowing. And that's the uh, success neurotransmitter. So I'll, I'll finish on that note. I love that. Thank you so much. So in a nutshell, keep chasing the, desire, the desired feelings you want because they feel good and you want them and you're motivated to get them. So everybody going through the Rocksteady program, it's like their number one thing to do is to find steadiness in their body and be able to connect with that at a very physical level and keep chasing the feelings that they want to feel. So as you keep chasing your desires and as kate just said you recognize and celebrate your little successes you are going to be educating the brain through this self-rewarding system and it's going to want more of that so you're actually starting to begin a healing flow where one behavior and one thought and one new habit formation leads to the next and rather than running away from what you don't want to feel you're actually running towards what you do want to feel. It's a completely different approach to rehabilitation, therapy, and healing. So we're not running away from symptoms or getting rid of them. We're actually running toward the neural pathways we want to build. So there's so much more information about that process on my masterclass for vertigo and tinnitus. There are heaps of free resources at seekingbalance.com.au to help you understand your anxiety pathways 
how to rewire your symptoms and the mechanisms behind them. And Kate specializes in occupational therapy for children with cerebral palsy. So if you want to connect with Kate, she's a wealth of information and it's pediatrictherapyandworkshops.com. Did I get that right, Kate? Mm -hmm. Yep, pediatrictherapyandworkshops.com. I'll put a little link underneath this call. And any parting words, Kate? It's been such a pleasure and I'm sorry we've had to wind it up because we've had this incredible thunderstorm that <laughs> got in the middle of our talk. But yeah, any parting words? Uh, I, I, I do want to say that this is, uh, is evidence-based practice. Mm -hmm. And I watched a, uh, one of your uh, video podcasts, uh, Joey, with, I, I don't recall her name, but if you want to refer the listeners to that uh, podcast, it showed uh, the representation of the brain through functional MRIs of mm -hmm. the actual changes in the brain that mm -hmm. you, we, all of us can make. Yeah, I think that it's might be evidence. from my free resources. Is it a link to the TED Talk? Is that the one you mean? Oh, I think it was a TED Talk. That's right. Yeah, so you can get that at my website, seekingbalance.com.au, and it's under the free resources tab. So I think step one to healing is just know that it's possible. The minute you know it's possible, the next step comes to you, right? So it's all about exploring and opening up because a rigid mind can't learn like an open-minded mind. So on that note, I want to say thank you so much, Kate, for your time and generosity and expertise. Uh, I look forward to a follow-up conversation because I think we've just touched the surface and there's so much more we can flesh out. Hmm. Well, okay. Thank you for inviting me, Joey, and helping me to learn a bit more about the wonderful work that you're doing. Great. I truly think that anybody who's come to see you has is seeking balance has come to the right place. <laughs> That's very kind of you. All right, Kate, until the next time, all the best and have a beautiful day. I hope you weather the storm well. <laughs> Bye for Bye, now. Bye, Joey.